Janice Gross Stein. In the complex world of global politics, few Canadians have helped guide our understanding of international and regional conflicts in Canada's role on the world stage more than Dr. Janice Gross Stein, Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management and Negotiation in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. A world-renowned scholar of the Middle East and a pioneer in the field of foreign policy decision-making, a committed educator and public intellectual, Dr. Stein has educated generations of students about the causes and consequences of war and the various instruments of statecraft that can be employed to bring about the peaceful resolution of disputes. Through her many publications, public lectures, and regular commentaries on radio and television, Dr. Stein has privileged us with a nuanced, measured, and sophisticated interpretation of world affairs. It is these and other talents that account for the enormous success she enjoyed in transforming the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto into the premier destination for international relations in North America. As its founding director, Janice Stein's name will be forever linked to the Monk School and the many accolades it has earned. Born and raised in Montreal, Dr. Stein received her BA from McGill University, a master's degree from Yale University, and a doctorate from McGill. It did not take long for Dr. Stein to make her presence felt in the academy. As her list of publications continued to grow, so did her reputation as an outstanding teacher. Indeed, it was her undergraduate survey course in international relations which she taught for years at the University of Toronto that earned her legendary status. On many occasions, as I wandered the stacks of U of T's Robarts Library, I would hear, overhear students speaking glowingly about the amazing lecture Professor Stein had just delivered. In fact, if not for a scheduling conflict that I had in my second year, I too would have shared that experience. Although I have always regretted not being in her class as she discussed the great debates in international relations with a passion and flair that became her hallmark, I too have benefited from her expansive knowledge. Fortunately, like countless Canadians, I've had the privilege of reading many of Dr. Stein's widely praised books, including The Cult of Efficiency and The Unexpected War, Canada in Kandahar. I and many others also listen intently to Dr. Stein during her regular appearances on TVO and CBC as she takes highly complex foreign policy issues and explains them in a highly accessible and thoughtful manner. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a member of the Order of Canada, a member of the Order of Ontario, and a recipient of the Molson Prize from the Canada Council, among other distinctions, Dr. Stein's long list of achievements is indeed impressive. Yet despite the stature she enjoys throughout the international community, Dr. Stein has never lost sight of the importance of teaching and guiding future generations of students to think critically about the world around them and to take chances. As she observed in a recent interview, and I quote, nothing great ever happens without failure. When we fail for good reasons, reasons that were not predictable, we have the invaluable opportunity to learn, reassess, change direction, and simply to do better the next time. As she has done for so many years, Dr. Stein continues to challenge us to speak out on world issues and to make our presence felt. This is a legacy for which she can be deeply proud. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and in the name of the Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, upon Dr. Janice Gross Stein.
By virtue of the authority vested in me as chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Congratulations, Dr. Stein. On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumna, Dr. Janice Stein, to address convocation. Chancellor Cowan, President Chakma, Dr. Don Abelson, Dean, Provost, distinguished guests, faculty, and most important, members of the graduating class from the Faculty of Social Sciences, families, and friends. Today is a very special day in your lives, one that you have worked very hard to achieve. Let me say on your behalf to your families and to your partners, that you are indeed an extraordinary class of graduates. You have a strong set of analytical skills, deep knowledge, a capacity for hard work, which really matters, which is joined with practical experience to navigate this new and troubled 21st century and to make a difference in it. On behalf of all the graduates today, I want to thank your families who provided so much support along the way and thank all your faculty who are so committed to you and to your success. Let me start this morning by saying something that I think will surprise you, especially after the weekend that we have all just lived through. There has never been a better time to be alive. Think about that for a moment. Never in human history has there been a better time for you, the graduating class, to be alive. How can I say that, you might ask? We hear all the time about the anxiety, even the fear, that seems almost everywhere, even in Canada. And as I listen to Canadians across this country, the language sometimes sounds almost biblical to me. There is the fear of plague, the Zika virus, which has engulfed South America and slowly travels north here. There's the fear of fire, as wildfires in large numbers burn out of control in our West and forces hundreds of thousands of people from their homes. There's the fear of water as the oceans rise and threaten to flood low-lying countries. There is, of course, the fear of war as increasingly warlike language comes out of the mouths of leaders in an aging and raging Moscow, in a newly assertive Beijing, and in what is to me almost an unimaginable election campaign that is currently going on in Washington. There is the fear of terrorism and fanaticism as innocent young men and women are beheaded and their heads tossed into public squares because of their sexual preferences. There is the fear of poverty, even in our own society, as we become more unequal and finally, there is the fear of the other, of people who speak different languages, who bring different cultures, of people who are on the move, uprooted from their own homes in unprecedented numbers. Leaders almost everywhere are speaking this language of fear. But I will say again, 
there has never been a better time to be alive. So why do I say this to you? Fewer people are dying today in wars than at any other time in recorded history. It's hard to remember sometimes, especially after the weekend we have, but this is the least violent period we've known. Terrorism does what it is designed to do, to terrify us by its randomness and its unpredictability. But take a breath. It kills very few people. That old joke is still true. You are more likely to drown in your bathtub, for the statisticians in the room, one in 800,000, than you are to die in any kind of terror attack, one in 20 million. We should be and must be horrified by the brutality of what we see, but we should not be terrified. Infant mortality rates have dropped dramatically. There were 4 million fewer infant deaths in 2015 than there were just 25 years ago in 1990. There is, this is also the best time in human history to be born. Global poverty has dropped by 50% since 1990 and is expected to drop again by half by 2030. And finally, the global middle class, young people like you, in countries that are now poor, is expected to grow from about 2 billion seven years ago to 5 billion by 2030. Half the world's projected population will have access to education at the post-secondary level. That's a good story, and we don't hear enough good stories in the times that we are living in. So take a deep breath. Now what is changing and changing rapidly is the structure of our society and of our economy. And each and every one of you who is graduating today will live these changes. I think it's fair to say that we live in disruptive and disrupting times. Innovation is disrupting our most basic institutions in society our governance processes, our educational institutions, universities like this one, our news media, our publishers, our journalists, our businesses. New peer-to-peer -peer patterns of communication are unlocking old hierarchies, decentralizing decision-making, and speeding up more than ever the pace and the flow of events that will require each one of you to make nimble, flexible, and quick decisions. The old, familiar, structured hierarchies that are so much part of our past will not produce the leaders of tomorrow. Now, overlaying this pace of technological change is the change in our social values. We're less loyal to existing institutions than we used to be. We trust our institutions less. We trust our leaders less. And we defer less to authority. And finally, and let me come back to this one because I think it is one of the greatest challenges that we face. We have more people on the move and displaced globally than at any time since the end of World War II. People who are fleeing persecution, fleeing violence, and looking to countries like Canada for economic opportunity and for safety. Each period in history has both challenges and opportunities, and this one is no exception. So let me do the familiar here and conclude with three pieces of advice. As you leave the university, and take these next exciting steps into the future. Of course, I expect you to ignore the advice. 
because you don't defer to authority and you don't trust institutions and you don't trust leaders. But I'm going to try anyway. The first piece, embrace innovation and change. You are an active group of leaders, skilled in challenging authority, but more important than that, talented in finding your own answers. You're engaged on civic issues as well as your professional life. Keep that going. Challenge, challenge, challenge. Sorry, parents who are in this room. The second one is as important, given the world that we live in now. Embrace difference. And I mean that seriously. Don't seek safe places filled with people who think like you do, because the world is not like that. Don't shield yourself from difference. Engage those you disagree with. Challenge them. Argue, even if what they say is upsetting to you, and especially when what they say is offensive to you. The bedrock of our pluralist society in Canada, a society that stands out in the world today, that we cherish, every one of us, is a shared willingness to disagree, but then to engage around that disagreement. None of you will grow and change and lead in spaces that, to put it bluntly, are politically correct, safe, and comfortable. Nothing and no one should be out of this conversation. And finally, as Professor Abelson said, I urge you to embrace failure. Sorry again to the parents. You may have thought your job was over, but it's not. Get ready to fail, but fail for smart reasons. If you don't fail, you will have taken no risk. You won't have stepped out beyond the expected and the known. You will have played it safe. And playing it safe is not what will make a difference to you, to your society, to your country, and to a world. But after you fail, and this is the key part, it's after you fail, get right back up. Learn from your failure. Share the reasons with others and try again. And if you do that, this university, where you were privileged to spend such important years of your life, will have succeeded and will continue to be proud of you. Congratulations again to you and to your families on this very special day.